Assalamu alaikum khawatin wazrat. Wasim Hassan welcomes you to the Virtual University of Pakistan. We're getting into lecture number 14 of Marketing for Nonprofits, MKT 6 to 8. The topic of learning is positioning. We are very well aware of the concept of positioning and the intention here is not to talk about what positioning is all about, rather to understand how it lays the ground for all operational strategies that we have to formulate to complete our programs and to achieve the mission. Basically, we also know it is the essence of the point of differentiation which we want stuck and placed into the minds of our target market about our programs with being different, carrying some uniqueness of character and features. And those are the features which are beneficial to the target market. We know very well that uh, the positioning has to be communicated with the essence of the brand with being very different from the rest of the crowd. And uh, if we succeed in communicating uh, this particular feature, uh, which is all about uh, some extra benefit or a benefit which is very different from the competitors, we are successful in positioning our brand into the minds of the target market. Another factor that we have to keep in mind is that uh, the positioning becomes very important in the nonprofit sector for the simple reason that we are operating at a competitive market stage. Anyone who thinks that uh, for the reason that nonprofits operate for noble causes and therefore nobody should be against those is kind of a misconception. The fact is that uh, we have to compete for so many different things in the marketplace. We compete for stakeholders, we compete for uh, the funds, and we also compete for programs. If we have a similarity of programs that are being offered by two different nonprofits or more than two nonprofits, we certainly are into competition uh, with those uh, entities in terms of selling the product. Here, we have to understand the nature of competition before we really can size up uh, the competition and then formulate our position, meaning the most appropriate position. For the most appropriate position to take place, we have to the size up competition and fully understand the nature of it. Whether it is the war on poverty or war on drugs or fight against cancer, or it's a question of getting into prosthetics, that basically is providing and fixing artificial limbs on disadvantaged persons all good causes for which uh, apparently there is no competition, but the fact remains there is competition in terms of seeking attention of different stakeholders. This is indirect competition, and it goes without saying that direct competition is the one in which we compete for the same cause. The meaning, if two NPOs are working on the same cause, they are direct competitors, and that makes it even more important to differentiate our program from the other one so that we really can stand out. The difference between direct and indirect competition is that in direct competition, we have to compete both backwards and forward. The backwards in the form of seeking stakeholders' attention and forward in terms of delivering the program because we are working out in the marketplace. In indirect competition, we compete just backwards. But the fact remains the importance of positioning that makes itself felt whether we are operating indirectly or directly. Therefore, the need to size up competition and measure it appropriately becomes even more intense. 
because that is the only way to move forward in terms of formulating our strategies. Lack of understanding on part of donors and funders and their inability to go deep into the cause should give us a better reason to come up with differentiation and place our program into the minds of all the stakeholders in a way that it becomes their conviction uh, that working for the program is going to be purposeful. And that is the beauty of communicating the position. And you can see here that the pivotal thing here is the point of differentiation which is communicated with the help of a positioning statement. And the positioning statement, as we all know, uh, communicates the promise that we make with the target market in terms of offering them the benefit that they are looking for and the benefit which already has made a place into their minds. And if they already have a good place in their minds, then our position is strong and well held by the target market. Getting back to the need to, uh, for uh, creating this point of differentiation, let me add here that we have to win the war on two different fronts. One is the money front because we have to generate money. The other is hearts and minds. And when I say hearts and minds, it obviously refers to the stakeholders and our customers. On the money front, we've got to break the belief paradox according to which they think all causes are just about the same with the bio-differentiating of a program and creating that conviction on their part that we really are different. So in other words, here, our job is to prove it to them that we stand to do things which are different. We have the capability of doing them and achieving the goals and fulfilling our mission. This way, our stakeholders, donors and funders in particular, will take us seriously and uh, look at our program through the same lens that we look at. The other front is that of okay, the hearts and minds. It again is a function of uh, creating a strong position into the minds of the stakeholders. In other words, we've got to prove it to the stakeholders that the program that we are running is credible, it is reliable, and it certainly carries a benefit for the target market, which is different from the rest of the crowd, and we have the capability to deliver that program. It is extremely significant to win the war on hearts and minds because this war takes place um, in there and not in the market. Uh, once we have won the two wars, we are all set to uh, create a position which is credible and which is going to be well held in the minds of the target market. Now, the next question is, how do we establish this position that I'm talking about? We have to go back to the concept of uh, strategic intent. We know that uh, it basically is uh, the function of uh, the resources, our capabilities, and core competencies. Out of all that flows our sustainable competitive advantage. And sustainable competitive advantage is the one which is not easy to copy, which is not easy to substitute, and which is something that we can sustain for a long time to come. And the once we are sure about the sustainable advantage that we have to ourselves, out of that flows the positioning for the brand. Knowing that a strong position homes into the hearts and minds of our customers and stakeholders, they get convinced that we can outperform our competition by first putting our programs more efficiently and then delivering them according to the promise that we made. We also are in a position to better manage our funds. This is the feeling that stakeholders must have uh, in order for them to continue giving their support to the cause that we are working for. There are certain attributes of a the strong position in the first place. Not all the features that uh, we see attached with the program could be the basis of positioning. In other words, 
if we carry out the strategic process, which basically is the backbone of uh, the positioning, then we shall see that we have uh, more strengths than one. And not all those strengths that should be our positioning points. We have to pick just the one of those. And the one that we pick is the one which can be very convincingly communicated to the target market in the first place and which carries the most meaningful benefit for the target market. The target market is not really concerned about all those strengths which go into the program to make it as beneficial as they want. So we have to talk about the benefit and it is that benefit which must be highlighted. So the feature that we pick is the one with which most optimally conveys the point of differentiation. To take you back to the example of um, the food bank, I think the point of differentiation in that example is reliable distribution. We have such a distribution network that we fulfill our mission on a daily basis by providing food to all those deserving families who must get their daily quotas. Whether they get those through the vans that we have as part of our logistics or they come to the distribution point and collect their food, they do get it by the end of the day. And that basically is the effectiveness of the distribution network. And therefore, our positioning there has to be that of a reliable distribution company. The target market is not really concerned about our ability to integrate different constituents who, through that integration and synergies, create such a setup that it is in a position to distribute food as effectively as we do. And therefore, it is the end thing with which really matters to the target market because that's where the benefit lies. And do not lose sight of the fact that positioning must talk about the benefit and it must revolve around the benefit which can easily stick into their minds and which is something they look forward to. And when they look forward to something, we have the opportunity of capitalizing on that by making that point our position. And another feature that we must attach to it, that the positioning has to be very simple, strong and simple. When we talk about the reliability factor in terms of distribution, I think we are being quite simple and it is something which is understandable and not philosophical. If you start talking about those philosophical points which are parts of the backbone of the whole program, it is something that should be a matter of concern in terms of internal marketing and not external marketing. It is not externally driven. Anything which is externally driven has got to be simple and strong. Yet another attribute that a good, strong position must carry is our ability to support that point with our strength. It is a very simple statement, which basically means that we have to be in a position to throw our weight behind our position. In other words, there may be certain features that we may find very attractive for the market as well as for the company, but we may not find ourselves in a position to support those features, however beneficial those may be for the target market, because we do not have the strength to support those features. We may not have resources, we may not have core competencies. We may have the basic capabilities which all of the competitors have, but if we do not have something which carries that point of differentiation, which adds to the capability, meaning the basic capability, and make it a core competence, then we should not be considering that particular feature as the point of positioning. So position has got to center around something behind which we can throw our weight. Let us go back to the example of the nursing home. We are in a position to make a very good combination of our resourcefulness 
and our execution capabilities in order to make our position very strong there. What is the position? The position is not about offering a space for living to elderly people because that's what every nursing home does. We are doing something extra and additional. And we're doing that maybe in partnership with other constituents. Whatever is the case, we are in a position to offer them self-dignity through certain activities which they can choose and carry out as part of their hobbies, as part of their normal living, normal, respectable living. It is not a place where they are just counting their days before they say goodbye to this world. They are living at a place where they look forward to the the rising of the next day. To summarize this uh, particular attribute, let me say here that uh, if you happen to be rich in resources and also have the execution capability of doing something in a very different way that you really can excel at that, then you should use all those strengths to support the position. Or in other words, you have to create a position which can be created by that richness of resources. So the positioning from that point of view also has to be resource-centric and also strategy-centric because any strategy or a set of strategies that you formulate in order to communicate the positioning have to be supported with the richfulness of the resources and your execution capabilities. Here, I also would like to draw your attention toward the fact that uh, the example does take into account integration of different constituents in the sense that this nursing home happens to be extremely efficient and different in that it has the support of certain partners. I'm referring to the example of cause marketing whereby you get into partnership either with a hotel, a restaurant, or maybe a clubhouse. Now, these are the places that really can offer expertise to the nursing home for it to become what it really is in terms of it offering an enjoyable life to its residents. And therefore, the role of the constituents is extremely important. And if you think that you can create a very strong position in partnership with somebody else, you should not hesitate doing so. Even if the partnership is not long-lived, it is going to be a short-lived phenomenon, you still can create a very strong position and then you keep it strong by keeping your programs as effective as they have been or rather even giving them more strength. Having known the attributes of strong positioning, the question that should flash into our minds is what is going to be the marketing implication of all that? Well, we as marketing people have to understand what exactly is in the minds of our target market. What exact position they carry in their hearts and minds. And for that, we have to carry out a little marketing research with the help of a focus group or something very close to it. At times, interviews also. But uh, the effort to unravel and what they really think about the program and the organization has to go on from time to time. And the ones we try to reveal that, we may find that uh, the target market has three different kinds of uh, conceptions or positions regarding our organization in their minds. One could be that uh, we are as good as anybody else, meaning that we do not really have a very specific position in the minds of the market. It is uh, not a good state of affairs. The second uh, perception could be that uh, we are carrying out the program in a very highly efficient manner, which means that we carry a very strong position. And the third perception could be that uh, we are not really an efficient organization and therefore people do not really look upon us as a group of uh, professionals uh, that could uh, fulfill the promise they made in the first place. A very um, difficult and challenging uh, kind of a situation. 
Now, how we deal with the, uh, these situations, the one by one, or, or whichever is the case, is a matter of strategy that we have to pick. We can fix the damage, but we have to have the right strategy, and which flows out of the findings that I just talked about. If it is a question of our being as good as anybody else, then it may be the question of uh, the pre-contemplation stage. And uh, we may find that uh, the people are not really aware of uh, the position of the program or the organization per se. And therefore, uh, we've got to put together a communication campaign that can create that kind of awareness and um, encourage the, the use of the product or the program that, uh, that we intend selling. The second uh, perception relates our having a very strong position because the market looks at us as uh, a bunch of uh, professionals who are extremely efficient. Now, here, there is a need to continue reinforcing the action stage of the customer because they have changed their behavior. They are acting upon what has been professed. And therefore, there is a tremendous need on our part to be very active in pursuing the campaign that we put together and uh, kicked off. So there's a need to come up with something which is a repetition of the same campaign or which may carry some additional elements. The best judge of the situation are the marketing people who know what to do with the mixed bag of communications. And this goes without saying that um, it is the communication which uh, basically takes over uh, all the concepts that we have talked about so far because it is through communication that uh, we become visible, we create awareness, that we talk with the target market, and they get to know what the whole thing is all about and what is it that we are trying to achieve. Communication strategies, therefore, are an extremely important part of the overall marketing strategies. The third perception that I talked about is uh, about our being an inefficient organization, in the meaning that we cannot even deliver what we promised. And uh, this is a state of affairs which uh, calls for probing into two different sides. The one is, is it that uh, it is just a perception or is it a reality? If it is a perception, we have to put together a communication campaign that can come to grips with that misperception clarify it, and do something which changes the position, the negative position in the minds of the customers or the target market. It is a daunting task, and we generally have to reposition our product or program for that matter, because undoing something first and then redoing it takes a lot more effort than it takes in the first place to create a new position. However, Whatever is the case, it has to be dealt with appropriately. If it is just a question of a misperception, then that misperception has to be cleared with the help of a very smartly put together communication campaign. Because the program is okay, and all the ingredients of the program that are going to form the basis of execution uh, happen to be in place, it only uh, is a question of communication uh, or, or the right communication not taking place, and therefore you have to have a smart communication campaign that can clear that misperception. It is not going to be as easy as it is said, but the fact is that probably is one of the better ways to come to grips with this kind of a problem. If it is a question of a reality, in the meaning it happens so that we are not an organization of efficient people, and we do not really have the basic capabilities and the core competencies, then it requires a very comprehensive strategic analysis of the whole process. We've got to go back to the strategic intent and take stock of the whole situation. The what is it uh, that is causing uh, this uh, problem? Is it the lack of resources, financial resources, human resources, 
or information systems or something else? Or is it that we do not really have the basic capabilities and we need to do something to revamp our human resource? Or is it that we do not have the financial resources? And if that's the case, we've got to go back to the donors and funders. And for that, we may also have to carry out some overhaul at the level of the board of directors or the top management. Or is it the question of core competencies? We have the resources, basic capabilities, but we cannot create a point of differentiation which could be pivotal in making the stage for that positioning to take place. So whatever is the situation or the challenge, it is the job of the marketing people to deal with that accordingly so that a simple, strong, and unique position of the program can take place in the minds of the target market. In this component, I'm going to provide you with an overview of uh, branding. This concept is very closely intertwined with uh, that of uh, positioning and both flow out of uh, the strategic process. Positioning, of course, takes precedence because it is an exercise toward highlighting the, what really is the point of differentiation. We communicate that with the help of a positioning statement and then doing everything with which basically flows out of that, meaning all our actions in terms of our strategic moves are a reflection of the positioning concept. And then we create the brand because that basically is the ultimate of the differentiation exercise. With the help of a brand or a brand name, could we tell our target market, here we are with the program or with the product which looks like the following way. It has the following features and that is how it is different from the rest of the market. And that exercise is dependent on positioning and that's why I said the two concepts are closely intertwined. As a matter of fact, we can say that the whole exercise of positioning is carried out so that we can come up with the rightmost brand. An effective brand which carries a lot of power. Power in the sense that it carries all those benefits um, with one being very major uh, that has the position in the minds and hearts of our target market. If we take a look at uh, different products on the commercial side, every product is a brand. There is no product which is uh, unbranded and same should be the case on the nonprofit side. The other fact is, if we take a close look at uh, the different uh, the good nonprofit organizations within our own country, we shall uh, come up with uh, a very satisfying kind of understanding that uh, there are so many uh, programs that are very strong brands. If we talk about the cancer facility in Lahore or uh, the kidney treatment center in Karachi or the eye care trust in Karachi, we know that these uh, programs are very strong brands because they have very strong differentiated positions and whatever they do, they do in a very differentiated way and they command a lot of respect in the minds and hearts of the target market. Why is it that uh, the people like to go to all these places in preference of uh, the many other places that may happen to be extremely expensive, but it is the reputation or in marketing terminology, the position they hold in the hearts and minds of their customers or the target market that attracts them to come towards them and develop a relationship with them. Brands, therefore, carry a lot of sentiments and emotions, and they also carry a sense of uh, brand loyalty, which is extremely important to with all the constituents of the program because they offer a lot of support toward the making and maintaining that brand and then nourishing it. So in other words, it is extremely significant to nourish a brand on a continual basis because once you have made it. And the fact is that uh, nourishment to commercial brands comes with via a revenue stream and profitability that brands 
create for themselves. And uh, the higher the profitability a brand creates for itself, the stronger it is, and for so many given reasons. By the same token, a brand on the nonprofit side should also be extremely strong. And it can become strong only if it has a strong position. It will have a strong position if it really rules the hearts and minds of all the stakeholders. Because for that nourishment that I talked about in relation to commercial brands, it comes in the nonprofit sector through the stakeholders. They are the ones who on a continual basis lay the ground for that nourishment. And they will do so only if they are convinced about the ability of the organization they are working for or they are supporting to deliver on the promise they have made with the target market. And the pivot around which the whole thing revolves is again the positioning first and then the brand. The brand is going to be taken seriously only if the organization is in a position to rule the hearts and minds of the target market, donors and funders in particular, and then all other important constituents, including activists and volunteers, by convincing them that their presence is not mere presence. They exist to do something extremely special, highly differentiated, and they have the core competencies to fulfill the promise that they have made. This is a statement that I've made so many times during uh, the different uh, components of uh, this lecture and also a little earlier. But the fact remains that these are the pivots around which all the strategies that we're going to have in place as part of the overall program will rest. And therefore, differentiation, uh, positioning, and branding have got to be given very special emphasis and concentration. To avoid making the brand, we have to put together uh, their support that I was just talking about with our execution ability. And once we have done that, we are all set to move towards creating a special brand identity. Because brand identity have to be then put together with the branding exercise in order to create and then maintain a brand. And as a matter of fact, when we do that, we basically emphasize the point of differentiation. Differentiation will never leave us, whether we talk about positioning or branding or raising the brand to the further heights, this is something that remains the pivot. Therefore, we can say with confidence that the two factors of brand identity and branding exercise bring the point of differentiation into a very sharp focus. And the fact is that uh, that happens to be the most important objective of uh, creating a brand because through that brand, the, you are selling that uh, differentiation. Therefore, we in turn can say that um, these factors highlight the existence of uh, the program and uh, it encourages utilization of uh, the particular program that we are offering. It ensures its uh, the usage and satisfaction on part of the customers if they find it satisfactory, which hopefully they do, and it lays the ground for brand loyalty in times to come. Brand loyalty is a very important factor that has to be created through this exercise, which starts with positioning and rather with the point of differentiation uh, and then gets into positioning and then the branding exercise with the help of brand identity because it is something that has to do a lot with that side of uh, customers' behavior and values that make him connect himself with the brand. In other words, when the customer connects himself with the brand, he develops a relationship. Once he develops the relationship, he expresses certain values and behaviors. And it is those values and behaviors that we want demonstration of, that we want generated in order for the customer to go ahead and make that connection to 
develop that relationship. So in very simple words, we can say that brands have a relational side and customers have a way of expressing themselves with the help of the values they carry and the behaviors they demonstrate by relating themselves with the brand. And they relate themselves with the brand by buying it, whether it is a product or a program. If it is a non-profit program, they subscribe to it. And they subscribe to it by creating that relationship. And while they create that relationship, they express certain values. So that is the key that we have to be very um, sensitive to because that uh, lays the ground for brand managers to not just create the brand, but rather further nourish it. Let's take um, an example of uh, the relation side of uh, the branding. You happen to be a donor who wants to patronize the fight for cancer. And the moment you donate, you express certain values because you are a sympathetic person, but you think that this is a fight that has to be uh, won and that can be won only if you could make the organization that offers that program rich in resources. So you donate toward that organization by expressing certain values. If you take a look at uh, the commercial side, this is exactly what you do when you buy a product. You are out to buy a motorbike, for example, and you value the sporty side of uh, the bikes and you express your values by buying a motorbike which you think really is very sporty. And if you think it is sporty, it has to be that way because you are the customer. And it is the customer who has to give approval of the real position of a product. And that real approval of the product is given the moment you develop the relationship by buying that product. So you have bought the product, you have developed a relationship, and you have expressed certain values. So by the same token, on the nonprofit side, you express your values by getting into another program that deals with uh, the environment. And uh, you donate toward an environmental cause because you think that controlling environmental pollution uh, should be of paramount importance to the society. That's the way you think. And your thinking has got to be respect it, and you make donation toward that cause. And the moment you do that, by developing that relationship, you are expressing yet another set of values. Now, if you happen to be a different consumer than the one who is uh, supporting the uh, fight uh, for cancer, you are a different segment. Whether you are the same consumer, customer, a donor, or you're two different individuals, the fact remains you fall into two different segments. And that takes us back to how to draw boundary lines among different segments. And this is an example of value-based segmentation, that you are segmenting two different groups of donors on the basis of their certain values. And they express those values through brand loyalty. And they have a loyalty toward a certain program. The next important question for the marketing people here is, they should think what is in there for them to do and act on. Well, the fact is that marketing people should try to develop an identity for their brand in a way that it ends up attracting prospective stakeholders who can relate themselves with their program, meaning with their brand, and express their values. If they relate themselves with the program, it obviously is going to lead toward expression of their values. And that really is the consummation of the action that the marketing people look for. In other words, whether your stakeholders have subscribed to the program, whether they happen to be donors and funders, activists or volunteers, or the actual target market for which you are working, because they are the subjects of uh, the behavior change, the action is done and the product or brand is created and you have created the equation following which the target 
audiences have shown their willingness to subscribe. Let us uh, talk about certain factors which uh, are to be considered by the marketing people before they set out to creating that identity and uh, try to evoke the kind of expressions on part of the target market they need for development of the relationship that I just talked about. Well, in the first place, they've got to fully understand the market. And then they've got to have a very clear understanding of the segment they want to really approach or a set of segments they want to approach. You remember with one program, you can approach more than one segment. So a clarity on the segmental constitution is of very high importance for the marketing people. It's not only that, it also is a complete understanding of the position of uh, your competitors and understanding of uh, all the variables that are responsible for uh, the making the position of your uh, competitor the way it is. So it is not just an understanding of the segment you're going to approach with the position that you have for your program. It also is an understanding of the positions of other competitors or other, other competitors' programs. This uh, calls for um, a very high level of appreciation of all the factors of internal marketing because uh, we are getting back into the strategic process which basically started with the strategic intent. And I tell you uh, in a repetitive manner that this is where the real rub is. If you pay attention to this particular concept of the strategic process, you will not go wrong when it comes to creating core competencies and then a sustainable competitive advantage and then the point or points of differentiation and then positioning and then branding and so on and so forth. The importance of internal marketing in which you fully understand what the organization is all about and where your strengths are, and where the weaknesses lie, and how you are going to lay your hands on the opportunities that the marketplace presents by warding off the threats. We have to understand that uh, branding is a very comprehensive and integrated kind of an exercise which uh, basically is a reflection of a host of different strategies put together by uh, different um, constituents of the organization. And uh, it is not just uh, the name of the product, the way it looks like or the colors it represents. It is uh, much more than that and much beyond that. With that, I would also like to add one more factor to it, and that is uh, the understanding on part of the marketing people of the imperatives of the external marketing. They have to take into consideration the importance of coherence and coordination. For example, in the strategy for distribution of food, you have to have a very well put together communication campaign that talks about the reliability factor and uh, assures the target market that uh, food will always be available for those who deserve that. But then, you are not in a position to put the distribution strategy in place as effectively as you have promised. That is a, is a reflection of a short circuiting. Here you see there is no match between two different strategies, meaning the communication strategy and the distribution strategy. So in terms of imperatives of external marketing, marketing people have got to be very sensitive to the need for having very well-coordinated strategies that draw on the resources of the organization in a way that the strategy critical factors are addressed most efficiently. In a way that there is no mismatch and there is no short circuiting.